In this lecture, we will be examining the history of the 1894 Pullman strike. This strike was a nationwide dispute between the American Railway Union, the ARU, and major corporate railroads that took place in the summer of 1894. The strike stalled a great deal of the nation's freight and passenger transportation west of the city of Detroit. Uh, the strike, however, was much more than just another late 19th century labor dispute. This was a test of the power of big business to influence government and attack the emerging power of organized labor. The Pullman Palace Car Company, which was established by George Pullman, produced railroad cars in the mid to late 19th century through the early decades of the 20th century. George Pullman got the idea for creating the company after he had a poor night's sleep in the 1850s on a bumpy rail car. He believed there was a substantial market for improved accommodations in rail travel. By 1862, Pullman had incorporated, and the Pullman name became synonymous with luxury travel. Pullman workers originally lived in a planned worker community that carried the name of Pullman, Illinois. The Pullman Company designed the sleeping car, an invention that carried the Pullman name. But Pullman did not simply manufacture sleeping cars. Uh, the company also operated cars on most of the American railroads in the United States, compensating railroads to attach its cars to their trains. The dispute between the ARU and corporate railroads was rather typical of labor management relations during the Gilded Age. The Pullman Palace Car Company provided for and controlled the lives of its employees to an extent that modern Americans would likely find to be very intrusive. Employees lived in the town of Pullman, they attended Pullman schools and churches, they shopped at Pullman stores, and they even used Pullman owned utilities. Pictured here is a form of script issued by the Pullman Company. Pullman found it could better control its employees if it paid them in scrip that could only be redeemed in a Pullman store or utility instead of cash. There were also, of course, financial advantages to doing so. Moreover, Pullman officials could enter an employee's home and order that worker to clean the house since they owned the house. The Pullman Company also began to ban saloons, non-company newspapers, and unofficial public meetings in an uh, effort to improve the morals of its workers. Here's a picture of the town of Pullman, Illinois. The town of Pullman was completely company owned. Pullman again provided housing, provided stores, had its own library, athletic fields, churches, and public entertainment for residents. At its peak there were an estimated 6,000 corporate employees and at least as many dependents in the town of Pullman. Pullman today has been incorporated into part of Chicago, the city of Chicago. The company made it mandatory that Pullman workers actually live in Pullman, in spite of the fact that less expensive rental units existed in adjacent towns. One employee uh, was quoted in the 1890s as saying, We are born in a Pullman house. We are fed from the Pullman shops. We're taught in the Pullman school. We're catechized in the Pullman church. And when we die, we shall go to the Pullman hell. It may be a bit of uh, hyperbole, but nonetheless it reflected how many Pullman workers felt about their employer and the town in which they lived. Due to cash flow problems associated with the Panic and Depression of 1893, Pullman slashed employee wages uh, by 30 to 50%. However, it did not lower prices paid by employees at company stores or the rent the company charged workers for housing. So this created uh, immediate cash flow problems for uh, employees. The American Railway Union, led by Eugene V. Debs, joined the strike and boycott of trains pulling Pullman cars. So this spread from just a, a smaller dispute involving Pullman and its factory workers to a much larger dispute. Debs hoped that the strike would uh, help him create one big union for all railroad workers. Uh, prior to this time, each specialized job in the railroad industry had its own union or brotherhood, and there was a lack of coordination between these smaller labor brotherhoods that uh, Debs wanted to correct or at least to uh, 
marshal the forces of each of these brotherhoods against their corporate employers. The company asked for and received a court injunction against the workers. The court agreed with the government's argument that the strike interfered with the delivery of mail, and thus this became a federal issue. The federal government also argued in court that the strike represented a public safety issue, as well as a disruption of interstate commerce, and thus constitutional freedoms of speech and assembly did not apply in the case of striking Pullman workers and railroad workers. Approximately 3,000 Pullman porters also participated in the wild, Wildcat strike, which shut down service on many American railroads. In total, some 250,000 workers were idled by the strike, and interstate commerce largely came to a halt in at least 27 states. Prodded by powerful railroad interests, the federal government decided to make an example out of the striking railroad workers. After a few incidents of vandalism against railroad property and some isolated cases of violence between strikers and law enforcement officials, uh, U.S. Attorney General Richard Olney, O-L-N-E-Y, ordered federal troops uh, to the area to restore order and break up the strike. Interestingly, to bolster his case against the union, um, Olney made sure that compliant railroads would hook mail cars onto trains with Pullman cars, even if they normally wouldn't um, be on the same route. Again, to um, highlight this idea that the strike was an attack on the U.S. mail service and thus uh, of a pressing federal need. Pictured in this image are U.S. troops uh, guarding railroads and rail cars during the 1894 Pullman strike. At least 12,000 federal troops were called in during the strike-breaking efforts. The introduction of federal troops actually seemed to have the opposite effect than intended because uh, vandalism, sabotage, and violence um, dramatically increased when the troops appeared. People seemed to be, uh, at least strikers, seemed to be incensed that the government would call out troops on American citizens. In the riots that followed after the introduction of federal troops, as much as $80 million in damage occurred against railroad property due to vandalism and sabotage, at least by their estimates, uh, corporate estimates rather. Dozens of people were killed, hundreds were injured in the violence. In the short run, this was a tremendous victory for big business, especially the transportation and manufacturing sectors. Uh, the power of organized labor was not able to stand up to the influence and financial resources of American corporations. Eugene V. Debs, the uh, former leader of the ARU, went to prison for six months for violating court orders, and the ARU essentially disbanded and was broken by the strike. Uh, Debs, who had not previously been a socialist, started reading the work of Karl Marx while he was in prison. Uh, after he got out, he helped form the American Social Democratic Party, which operated for a few years before uh, merging into the American Socialist Party. He was also an important figure in the emergence of the more radical international workers of the world, the IWW, which we will get to in a later lecture. Debs was also the Socialist Party of America candidate for president in 1904, 1908, 1912, and 1920. However, in the long run, the American labor movement learned from its mistakes in the Pullman strike. Um, one side note, Labor Day became a national holiday in 1894, after the strike ended, President Grover Cleveland and American politicians from both major parties uh, attempted to patch things up with organized labor. labor. Um, Congress passed the legislation for Labor Day just six days after this strike ended, so it was uh, instrumental in the development of Labor Day, although, of course, not the only labor action that led to this. Um, Samuel Gompers, who spoke out against the ARU and the strike, benefited here. He saw his American Federation of Labor um, grow as a result of not participating in the, participating in the strike. Uh, by the beginning of World War I, the AFL was the leading American labor union. And this brings to a close our brief look at the causes, effects, and aftermath of the Pullman strike of 1894.